Good morning, online grouping. Good morning again, everyone else sitting here. Um, we have a couple news and announcements that we would like to make um, before we jump into our service. Um, our first one is, um, you'll see at the back of your bulletins, our annual, or I should say bi-annual, twice a year, um, SBC Book Club. Our Advent study will be God in the Manger Reflections on Advent and Christmas by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, if you would like to join that study, please send me an email indicating. Um, by the end of this week, I will send out an email to everyone who's told me that they're interested in joining the study. Um, if you do not see the email by next Sunday service, please say, hey, I didn't get the email if you wanted to join. Uh, it's going to be a great study. Again, it's a devotional book, so you'll be reading about a page of it every day throughout the Advent season, and then we will be getting together on Sundays to discuss how the week has been going, what you thought of the different, the different connection points. Fantastic study, fantastic book. I'm really, really excited about it. Um, that is the first step of news and announcements. Uh, the second is um, we're working on putting something together, and the leadership will discuss it more in two weeks. But I kind of want to plant the seed with you guys to see if uh, your interest and excitement. Um, Amber's had it on her heart for probably about six months now for us to do something as a church family over the holidays. And her thought is doing a Smithfield Baptist Church pastor's um, Thanksgiving supper. It would be either the week before Thanksgiving or the week after. It's only for church family for us to gather together, to fellowship, to enjoy I have it on good authority that the turkey would be made by me and my spouse uh, and anyone else who would like to volunteer an oven for a couple hours on, on a day. We're still working on dates. Leadership will be talking about it more. Um, if that interests you and you want to participate, please let me know. Uh, if I don't hear anything, I'll still work with it on leadership, but I think it would be an excellent opportunity. So it would be obviously not Thanksgiving week. It would be either before or after Thanksgiving. It's kind of a fellowship gathering for all of us to get together, um, to spend time together, do what we like to do, just be a family together, which I think is awesome. All right, so that is tentatively in the works. The next thing that I want to highlight is one of our ministries down the line, Gospel in Action, Malawi. Um, it has been an outreach that we've been very faithful to over the last few years. We've had them come out as guest speakers, if you remember, the well drillers in Africa. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, they also do a um, student sponsoring um, over there, and we are participating again. I have heard back from the leadership already. So we are sponsoring school supplies, school lunches, some other things um, for kids over there. So that is a ministry that we are still participating in this year. Um, so keep it very much in prayer and lift that up. Um, as well as the rest of our missionaries, I just got word that none of the missionaries that we highlight will be actually coming to Maine at the end of this year. I thought two of them would be and one of them would be going to the annual meeting. Um, but things in the world have gotten hard. They've gotten difficult. And so they're staying in the mission field. So uh, if you choose to go to the... Um, American Baptist Church's annual meeting, which will be in green this year. If you were to participate there, you would see a brand new missionary that actually isn't one of our dedicated six that we follow and that we serve. Um, they'll be coming, speaking about their missionary uh, mission as well. Um, but one of our missionaries, none of our missionaries are coming. Um, ideally, we'll see some of them in the state of Maine, hopefully next year. Um, spring summer in that window as soon as we get more information i'll let you know um so that we can partner and maybe go to a cl church close to them they'll typically go to like an area and like multiple churches will gather there to be with them and then they'll go to another area uh, i'll let you know when that swings around all right uh that is all the news and announcements that i have at the moment um oh uh, one more news and announcement um so the Smithfield General Store did not actually open this past week. Um, I'm heartbroken for it. I'm getting very excited. Uh, I'm not sure what they have there that's non-dairy related that I can eat, but I'm still excited to find that out myself. Um, don't have a tentative open date yet. Uh, I will let you know as soon as we get more information. We have a couple 
couple ears to the pavement, so to speak, within the congregation. Uh, we'll let you know as soon as we get more information on it. But uh, if you find out before I do, if you're driving by and you see it open, yeah. Monday. Monday. This Monday. <gasps> Praise God. Ear to the ground. I love it. This Monday. This nice. So we're looking at this Monday now. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. What day is it? <laughs> it's Sunday, right? Okay. It's been a long week, all right? Kids are back to school. We had a, we had a soccer game until midnight. It's been a long week. So Monday, tomorrow. Praise God. I hope that it opens tomorrow. Um, if it does, let me know. Remember, if you want something there, you got to go to something there. That's how it works. We support our communities so that the only place that we're stuck with isn't Walmart. That's why we support other communities. If you like Walmart and you only want Walmart in the world, then by all means, only go to Walmart. But if you want, make, if you want something better than McDonald's, Burger King, and Arby's, support the little guy. Um, as we no doubt will be doing over the course of the year. All right. On that, oh, I got one more set of announcements, and it involves singing. Are you guys excited? We have two birthdays in our congregation. Lily, happy birthday. Thank you. And someone thought they could sneak through the cracks, but they forgot that I have to log on to Facebook at least for five seconds in the morning to upload my gospel at daybreak. Becky's birthday was last week. Oh, Linda. Linda was. Look at this. <laughs> I guess I'll drag everybody in. <laughs> All right, everyone. Who, who has a birthday this week? Anyone? Hands? Show of hands? I, was, I gotta tell you, that's like the one good thing about Facebook is it alerts you when someone has a birthday. If they allow it. If they allow it? Yeah. Nice. Some people's birthdays don't. That's awesome. Does mine show up? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's sing happy birthday together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thank you. All right. I was going to do that before I put the camera on, but you dodged it, so you're going live. Just kidding. All right. On that note, let us take a moment of silent reflection and prayer to center ourselves into worshiping God today. Just lift up your stresses, your worries, your anxieties. Just repent to the Lord. If you're holding back something, just give it to him today, and then we can worship with a Open, open heart. Let us pray. Right, let us call ourselves to worship with our praise chorus. He is Lord. It's number 54 in your pew Bibles. I'll have you rise and then just stay standing as we go right into our first hymn.
please turn to hymn number 322, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. We're going to sing verses 1 and 3. seated. Please open your pew Bibles to uh, Psalm for today, Psalm number 11. It's on page 533, Psalm 11. We will read this responsively. I will read the odds, you read the evens. That means I begin with one and, you end, and I end with seven. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord tests the righteousness, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Let us pray. Lord, Thank you. Thank you for your awesome power in your glory. Lord, it is you that we take refuge in. You hate the wicked, though they plan to attack. Your throne is all-powerful. Your glory is greater than the schemes of man. Though it seems like evil and violence may overcome us, Lord, you alone are in control. You will hold them accountable. You will judge them. Lord, thank you for sending your son to us so that we may not be counted as part of the evil world, that we may have his righteousness and not our own to stand with. Lord, your son went to the cross because of our sins because of our failures. Yet that was not the end. He rose from the grave so that evil would lose, and it has lost. And so I pray you encourage us as we worship you today, Lord. I pray you encourage us all week. You strengthen us, you give us resolve to know that though it may seem dark around us, we are light provided we are shining your light. I ask, Lord, that we seek your face, that you give us all the right answers, that you encourage us. 
Be with us, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, let us open our hymnals now to number 477. It only takes a spark. you to be with all of us. I ask you to be with the world, our nation, our state, our community. Bring wisdom to our leaders. Bring guidance to their hearts. Lord, be with all of our brothers and sisters. Encourage them, strengthen them, give them wisdom and resolve to stand with you. And be with the martyrs and their families across the globe. Be with those who worship you in places in which the gospel is hostile. We have so many brothers and sisters, Lord, that are worshiping you today, that do so under pain of death. We ask you to keep them encouraged and let their wisdom and their sacrifice be a light to the world around them. Look after all of us, Lord. Protect us and guide us. This time, let us recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power Let's recite the doxology.
be seated. That's where I've heard it from. The song that we just, the hymn that we just sang, It, it Only Takes a Spark, that same music was used in the Garfield Christmas special. It really was. It totally was. All right. I'm going to double check that when I get home, but I'm like 99.95% .95 sure that that was it is. Because I'm thinking like Charlie Brown, it sounds like Charlie Brown, but it's not. It's Garfield. All right. Sorry, guys. That's what we call a tangent. All right. Today's passage is on Daniel chapter 11. It's verses 1 through 21. I will read it now, but trust me, I won't be going verse by verse through the whole thing. So you will be out in time for football, I promise. All right. Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 21. And it says this. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be richer than all of them. And when he has become strong enough, his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule the great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others beside these. When the king of the south shall become strong, but one of his princes shall become stronger, and then he shall rule, and his authority shall be great and a great authority. After some years he shall make an alliance, and the, daughters of the, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come up to the king of the north and make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up to her and her attendants, who, he who fathered her and who supported her into those times. And from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in, this, in his place. He shall come up against an army and enter the fortresses of the king of the north, and they shall deal with him, and he shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold and for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north then the latter shall come to the realm of the king of the south but shall return to his own land his son shall wage wars and assemble a multitude of great forces which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through and again shall carry war as far as his fortress the king of the south, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the kings of the north, the king of the north, and shall arise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail. For the king of the north shall again rise in multitude greater than the first, and after some years he shall come with a great army and abundant supplies. In those times, many shall arise against the king of the south, and the violent among your, and violent, violent among your people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Then the king of the north shall come and overthrow and throw up siege works and take well fortified and take a well fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not stand, or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in glorious land with destruction in his hand. He shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom, and he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of the women to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or be of his advantage." Afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them. But a commander shall put an end to the insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall return his face back towards the fortress of his own land. But he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. 
In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom the royal majesty has not been given. Uh, he shall come without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. All right. So what I have just read to you is the first half of the most accurate part of biblical prophecy in the entire Bible. This was shockingly Shockingly accurate to the point where skeptics, the only argument they can make against this is that it had to have been written after all of these events actually happened. The only problem with that is we have historical documentation, not in the Bible, saying that the scroll of Daniel was actually read and seen before the events happened. And so what we have here is we have honest prophecy. If you remember from chapter 10, Daniel had been mourning and fasting because Passover was happening and it, Jerusalem had not returned yet, even though it had been a few years. The temple wasn't rebuilt yet. There was conflict. He was struggling with it and he was fasting. And then God sends a messenger. We debated who that messenger was last week. We don't even discuss it this week. I'll be moving on. But sends a messenger with a clear message of what the future looks like. And this is what we see play out here. And this is so shockingly accurate. We can say that all of this is accurate because all of this is our past. To Daniel, it's in the future. This prophecy starts after Daniel is long since dead. Because it says that there's going to be four kings after Daniel. After this in Persia, and there were four kings. The fourth one was the greatest. That was King Xerxes. Many of you may have heard that name before. He was the richest, the most powerful king. He was also the king during the time of Esther. It was King Xerxes who Esther was interacting with in the kingdom. But King Xerxes eventually got so powerful that he waged war against Greece and ultimately lost. And so we see him gaining power here in verse 2. It will be grown strong. He shall stir up against the kingdom of Greece. That happened. In verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise and shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. We've talked about this in previous prophecies from Daniel. This is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquers the whole land of Persia very, very quickly, within 12 years, before he dies of likely typhus, uh, typhoid in um, Babylon. Alexander the Great takes over the whole territory. And when Alexander the Great dies, his kingdom doesn't go to his heir. It doesn't go to someone he appoints. He famously said on his deathbed, may the strongest inherit my kingdom. And that led to four generals of, uh, of Alexander the Great taking over this whole area. Cassander and I always butcher the other person's name, Lyamicus, or two of them that we're not going to talk about today because their kingdoms were kind of weak and fledgling and didn't really last long. The two big ones that we are going to deal with right now is General Seleucus starting the Seleucid dynasty, which takes place in modern day. His kingdom was over what's now modern day Syria, Iran, Iraq in that area. He's the king of the north because he's north of Jerusalem, north of Israel. And then the Ptolemies, which you no doubt have heard of, covering down the Egyptian areas, that is the king of the south. Those are the two big kingdoms in this area. And so God is giving Daniel a vision of what it's going to be like dealing with the interaction of these two kingdoms, because they warred back and forth. They've had peace treaties, they married, they're princes and princesses to each other to try to form bonds and peace. And, you know, whenever you marry for power, it's not good for marriage or for the, the throne. Um, but they did that. They tried all of those behaviors. And so we're looking at two kingdoms surrounding Israel. And we're learning more and more detail about them. And I'm not going to go into detail of every possible line. But trust me, I watched probably 30 hours worth of videos over the last two weeks that broke down verse by verse in the actual historical events 
that took place that mirrored that so perfectly from extra biblical sources, from Greek authors, from Persian authors, from early middle-aged authors to others who have all confirmed to Roman authors. You have moments where it says in like verse six, in some years you shall make an alliance with the daughter of the king of the south and she'll, she, she shall be the king of the north and to make an agreement, but she shall not retain her strength of her arm and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up to her attendants who fathered her. There's a princess, I think, I always try to, I always end up saying Beatrice, but that's wrong because it's very Anglo-Saxon Beatrice, but it, it looks like that when I read it. Bernicius or something like that. There was a princess, Bernicius, who actually was married off to a northern king, had a child, and was murdered by her husband, the king, at the same time that the king was murdered, at the same time that the southern king was murdered. It all happened within one year. And so it left her child king up in the Seleucid dynasty and another child king down in the northern dynasty, which added a whole lot more of conflict. But all of that played out exactly as it had been written. And so as we went through this, if we went line by line, I can give you support of conflict, military history, backing, um, any type of event to support that. But I won't because we'll be here forever. And <coughs> you guys like history, but I've taken the, the temperature of the water before. And uh, it's not that much history that you're in love with. <coughs> but trust me when I say that this event, this prophecy is so perfectly and utterly, completely filled, fulfilled, that it almost feels like God's showing off. Like God's like, Daniel, check this out. It's going to happen exactly like this. And it happens exactly like that. In fact, I've listened to people go back and forth before, and a question that you can find online a lot, and I've heard it said before, is why does the Bible stop at Malachi and then pick up again at Matthew? Like, what's going on with those 500 years? Why is it just silence for 500 years between Malachi and Matthew? Any of you had that question before? Nods, yes, no. Well, if you want to know what's happening then, it's this. Like, Daniel 11 takes place during that period of time. That's when the Seleucids and the Ptolemies are either warring back and forth or making treaties, making connections. It happens during that period of time. And so I asked myself as I was studying this, because I, I always ask the basic question, right? Why? Why did God give Daniel this prophecy? Like, why did God spend the time talking about two pagan nations and not Israel? Because Israel is kind of in it. We see Israel a little bit in verse 14. It says, in those times, many shall arise against the king of the south, and the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they'll fail. So there's some conflict here in which... As Israel was going between southern territory and northern territory, there was some revolts, but it never really worked out. And I believe that's the reason why we discussed this. Lincoln just really wanted that point home. Were you paying attention? Because he really wanted you to hear that point. Why? The reason why I believe that God highlights this is because he's reminding us that not every battle, as we talked about last week, is physical. That there's a spiritual element to every conflict. And so when he's talking about the Seleucids and he's talking about the Ptolemies, he might as well be talking about Israel's two greatest enemies in our biblical story. Egypt, who enslaved Israel. The Jewish people for 400 years and Babylon who conquered Jerusalem and judged them so Ptolemy I'll do it this way Ptolemy if you're looking at a map it would be here Ptolemy and the Seleucids they're just Babylon in Egypt and that's really all the world ever is it's just Babylon in Egypt but you think about modern conflicts right now Egypt, even though it is currently at some semblance of peace with Israel, has been a great 
conqueror and has been a great aggressor against Israel since 1948 in modern times. And the Seleucids is Iran. I mean, you can't get much more hate against Israel than Iran right now. They're kind of the poster boy of it. So it's like years change, players change, the story remains the same. Does that make sense? And it's all about the conflicts surrounding Israel. And it is very unique that this prophecy begins with not even talking about Israel, when most of Scripture is about what's happening to Israel, but what is happening around Israel, which paints us into what verse 21 through the rest of Daniel 11, which we'll talk about next week is, is Antiochus Epiphanes, the great Antichrist figure that arrives then, that is a shadow of the Antichrist to come. But we're just seeing the groundwork here. And I laughed a little bit as I was putting this message together this week. Because it really is true. The more things change, the more they stay the same. We all no doubt witnessed and um, have read on the news that Queen Elizabeth passed away this past week, right? I know I'm sad. She seemed like she was a really nice lady. Never got to meet her. But um, I wasn't as emotionally turmoiled as some of the, my friends were about it because, I mean, really since the late 1700s, <laughs> hasn't really mattered that much what's going on with the King of England or Queen of England. But she was a very, uh, seems like she was a very sweet ruler. She led them, England, through really the end of the Pax Britannica uh, into their kind of a modern state. She was a very powerful world figure, and I understand why people are upset. Um, and earnestly mourning her. But what I reminded myself is when I was listening to that, I'm like, huh. The Hundred Years' War between England and France is very similar to the Seleucid conflict between Seleucids and the Ptolemies. I mean, over that period, you had the invasion of both people. The French tried to invade England. England invaded France. You had two kingdoms that were trading princes and princesses to try to set up fragile alliances that didn't work out. You had conflict and war and debate, and if you watch Game of Thrones, it's pretty much that. If you read, if you watch Downton Abbey, it's pretty much that, only with automobiles. Uh, you see that type of conflict back and forth between all of them. And it really stopped to me, because the more things change, the more they stay the same. God gave Daniel the future. And now we see it as our past. It gave Daniel hope that God was in control of what's to come. Because that's the main thing, and keeping the main thing. The point of Daniel 11 is for us to remember that God is in control. That the future for us is history to God. He knows it, he's planned it, it's done. Daniel didn't know this. Daniel didn't know all the names. Daniel didn't know all the details. But it happened, at least to God. And so when we live in our lives and we turn on the news and this world power is warring against this world power or this state representative is arguing with this state representative or this person is standing out on a bridge holding some sign, like this person is arguing about it, when we see people bicker back and forth for politics and religion and everything, I urge you guys to have humility in your hearts. To remind yourself that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And don't forget that if someone disagrees with you on any topic, opposes you against your faith, that they are not an enemy to be vanquished. They're a victim to be pitied and to help. They're part of this conflict. And there is no argument against God that anyone can make that hasn't already been refuted for the last several thousand years. But this war in this world is doing everything possible it can to move away from God. And we have
the great burden of standing with God in that conflict. And it is easy for us to make enemies out of everyone who disagrees with us. Social media has done that very, very well. It is so much harder to follow Christ's teachings when he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus taught us that not because he didn't think it was, not because he thought it was easy, but because he knew that the real battle isn't the worldly one that's happening. That it's in the heart. And so if you have a neighbor or a friend or someone who ridicules you and harasses you and insults you because of your faith, pray for them. Because God willing, they will come to Christ one day and you will celebrate that victory. If every Christian in the world turned me away when I was in high school, I would not be a minister right now because as you know, I did not grow up Christian. I didn't find Christ until my 20s in earnest. And I made every possible argument against God and the one thing that I kept finding as I did it was that I didn't really care about how it was answered. I just wanted him not to be real. And so I had a good friend of mine who was a pastor and I would give him gotcha question after gotcha question. And he would take time and he would answer it. And his answers were always sufficient. I didn't care about his answers. I cared about the next question I could ask him. And that's, when you're dealing with the world, that's what it's like a lot of times. But I urge you to have love and humility. Show Christ when you interact with them online. Pray for them when you're in person. And remember that if they are treating you poorly, they're giving you every example to follow Christ and pray for those who persecute you. Because we don't have to fight God's battles for him. He is perfectly good, as we remember from Daniel 11, on dictating what is going to happen. Pray for them. Encourage yourself. Be with each other. All right, and so next week, we transition, and I intentionally put a break here in verse 21, because as we have been talking about it, the second half of it, we start talking about another figure, Antiochus Epiphanes, which I've touched on previously, and I'll go into more detail next week on. Uh, this is like the best example of the Antichrist that I think we are given. This is the example that Jesus uses when he talks about the abomination of desolation. This is the person that Jesus points to in Jewish tradition that says, hey, when the Antichrist is here, it's going to be like this, only worse. And so I felt like a good break to get through the histories building up to him and then turning ourselves into him. So, um, and a foreshadow, obviously, of the Antichrist to come. So I pray that you have an absolute blessed rest of your week. I pray that you look at the history around you, you look at the news, and you think to yourself, you know what? It's all been written already. I just don't know the ending yet. Let that be an encouragement. Let that guide your prayer life. Let that encourage yourself. Don't shy away from sharing the gospel with anyone because you don't know at what moment the light will go on. But don't be discouraged if you're laughed at. Don't turn that person into an enemy. Just as Jesus consistently ate with sinners, so shall we. That does not mean that we affirm their sin, that we participate in their sin. <clears throat> but I believe I said it in one of my devotions earlier. It is much more beneficial for a light to be shining in a cave than next to a bonfire. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for guiding us through all of human history. I am encouraged to know that your will will be done. Just as Daniel was given future prophecy that is now our past, so do we have future prophecy that will one day be our past. And Lord, we look forward to that great day when your son returns, when he gives us new bodies and a resurrected life, when he defeats evil and sin once and for all, and we live 
for eternity in your presence in a new heaven and a new earth, Lord. We do not know how that will come about. We do not know when that will come about. But we ask you, Lord, that you are with us every moment as we patiently wait. That we are encouraged and that we are strengthened. That we reach out to our neighbors as best as we can to share the gospel. For one day, it will be too late. Lord, I ask you to use us. Be with us. Look after us. And let us be your light. Shining the gospel of truth. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right. Please open your hymnals now for our final hymn. Number 321, when we walk with the Lord, we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5. us as we go out into this world. Guide our hearts and guard our minds. Following you, Lord, is the joy of our life. It's not easy. For many times we want to do and act a different way. We want to be right. We want to think we know what's best. Sometimes, Lord, it takes a moment for our heart to just be quiet and seek your face. I pray you encourage us this week. I pray that you strengthen us and that we see examples of your hand over all that we do and all that happened, Lord. Be with our brothers and sisters as they interact. Look after them and allow us to gather again in your name. For we ask this in the name, the name above all names, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. May God bless you. I'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.